sleepapnea.org presents Portraits Living with Sleep Apnea, a conversation with Teresa Schumard. Teresa, what was your sleep apnea story? Uh, I, I was really in denial and being a sleep tech, here I was telling people how to live and what to do, and I wasn't following my own advice for a long time. And then I decided that that was crazy, and I had to do something to make me stop falling asleep in the daytime. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I totally had to accept it and, and just say, well, I'm going to treat it. Just like I treat other people, I'm going to treat myself so I'm better. Was CPAP therapy a quick fix? Uh, I had to persist with the mask because I wasn't quite sure that that one was the right one for me. And then I, I kept plugging along and I had access to any kind of mask I wanted, really, and found one that worked for me. So it was fine then. I was fine. And I was able to tolerate it. Was your perspective different as a caregiver? As a sleep tech, it was very rewarding for me to be able to see progress when a patient would wake up after they had been uh, having their CPAP titration, that uh, they felt alert. They, they would say, this is the best night of sleep I've ever had, or the fog was lifted, that kind of thing. And many times these people were the very ones falling asleep in the chair as I was hooking them up to have their sleep study. So it was amazing to me to be able to see that progress and see that they were well. Unlike a lot of other sections of medicine that I had worked in, this was, this was very nice. There was, no, uh, there was no negative to it. It was all positive. What about waiting to get better? Uh, when someone has to wait after they've had their sleep study and their CPAP titration, to have to wait two weeks to get your machine is just awful. It gives them a sense of, oh, so I have to wait two more weeks, and sometimes it's longer than two weeks. Many sleep centers will actually dispense the next morning because they don't, they don't want their patients driving around sleepy anymore. They want them to have that CPAP machine as soon as they've gotten to a level that works to eliminate the apneic events. In what ways can treatment improve? I hope that we can advance to the point that we can treat children early on, that we can we can do the education, we can get into the schools, we can, we can talk to little children about good sleep and good sleep hygiene and all those things. But unless they are examined when they're very young, it's, you know, something could be missed. You know, what is the airway looking like? What is the mouth looking like? Uh, do they have a small mouth? Do they have uh, large tonsils. I mean, you can almost look at a child and see when they have an obstruction. You can hear them talking and have an obstruction. You can hear the obstruction. So it's, uh, I think that we just need to do a better job about educating the moms and the dads out there that, you know, have your baby tested. Have your baby, you know, look at your baby. If you don't want to go through the normal testing procedure, put a, put a camera on them at night. When they're sleeping, listen to the pauses in breathing because that's what's happening time after time. My grandson was a, far, a very good example of this. He's now four. He was three when this happened. He went to the dentist, and the dentist said, his frenulum is too short. It, it's, it needs to be clipped. And, and he wasn't talking. He wasn't talking at all. He wasn't making any any, you know, attempt to talk. They clipped his frenulum like the next day or something. He started talking immediately. And he's four years old now and he's reading. So it's, it's just, it was just a, and this was all happening as we were reviewing the data and it was happening in my own family. So I was very happy to see that and to see that he is, he's thriving. 
What are some of the benefits of the Awake Together Summit? The benefits of a conference like this are that we're getting the story out there that, yeah, we've raised awareness over the last 30 years about sleep disorders, but we haven't we haven't reached everyone, obviously. There's still a lot of misconception, a lot of misinformation out there. You can see it any time that you are in a support group online. You can see people coming in there with, you know, incorrect information. Uh, and that's not to say it's wrong. I mean, I, I applaud people for reaching out to others and helping them through, you know, their CPAP journey or their sleep apnea journey, I should say. Uh, but it's 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 just a shame that not everybody is educated. And so we hope, we hope with just a little more work that we'll be able to get the message to everyone and by starting in the schools. That's the answer. That child will grow up knowing what is good sleep hygiene. Why should I go to bed at this time? Why should my room be a certain temperature? All these things are very important and appealing to children, I think, we just need to be out there in the schools. We need to write curriculum for grade school teachers. You know, all these things are going to help, I think. And I think we have to start with the moms and the dads, really educating them, because it's really ultimately up to the parents. To learn more, visit sleepapnea.org now.